Bible Church and our online family and friends. Thank you for joining us on tonight. We ask that you will click that share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. It is only because of God's grace and mercy that he has allowed us to still be here. So regardless of what is going on in our lives, regardless, regardless of our situations, let us continue to thank God and praise God for things being as well as they are. Our scripture comes from 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16. And in this scripture, Paul is giving gratitude to God for the mercy that God has shown him. This scripture lets us know that there is no sin that's so great that God cannot save you if you just put your trust in Jesus. 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16, and it reads, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our God was. He filled me with faith in the love that comes from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Our song is Your Grace and Mercy Brought Me Through. I'm just going to sing the chorus of that song. I am living this moment because of your grace and your mercy. Your grace and mercy God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus of Christ we come. God, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another great opportunity, Father God, to come before you. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you will do, and what you're doing right now, Father. 
We thank you, Father God, for sparing our lives. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for bringing us through, Father God, as only you have. Lord, we ask you to continue to bless us as we study your word. Forgive us for our sins, Father God, that your word of God will go forth and that it will penetrate our hearts and make us better on today than we were on yesterday. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us and continue to give us your grace and your mercy. And we'll be careful, Lord, to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. It's in the mighty, precious, powerful name of Jesus the Christ, we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Yeah, 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 Lord. Your grace and mercy. Your grace and your mercy. Yes, yes. It is God's amazing grace and His tender loving mercy that has brought us through. And we thank Him for it. We appreciate Him. And we thank Him for bringing us through. For we couldn't bring ourselves, but God blessed us. He blessed us again. And He has given us another chance to look at His Word. We're in Colossians chapter 1 verses 17 and 18. The book is Colossians. The chapter is 1. The verses are 17 and 18. Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. When you found it, you will discover these words. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. We're talking about Jesus, he. He begins in verse number 17 using the personal pronoun, he. He talks in the second person because he's talking, he talks in the third person rather, because he's talking about somebody. So he says, he. Before we go any further, we need to address the word he. This word he is Jesus the Christ. This word he is the son of man. He is the son of God. So Paul says in Colossians, verse 17, chapter 1 of verse, chapter 1, verse 17, Paul says, he, he says, and he is before all things. Who is the he? He is Jesus Christ. He, he is the son of man. He is the son of God. He is the Christ. As we walk through chapter 1, up to verse 18 tonight, uh, we found that Jesus is described in seven different prospects. Jesus is described in seven different ways. This he that he talks about, he's talking about Jesus Christ. First of all, he describes Jesus, number one, as the image of God. Jesus is the express image of God. He is, Jesus is the express image of God. He is the profile of God. He is the visible image of the invisible God. Who is? Jesus Christ is the image of God. Secondly, he describes Jesus, Paul does in Col Colossians, this first chapter, he talks about Jesus and Jesus alone. Secondly, he describes Jesus as the firstborn over creation. He describes Jesus the Christ as the firstborn over all creation. This firstborn, this firstborn is the first begotten, the first begotten son of God. 
the firstborn over all creation. There was nothing created that was not created by Jesus the Christ. He secondly is the firstborn over creation. The third thing he describes Jesus as is the creator of the universe. Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. He is the creator of the entire world. Who is? Jesus is. He's the creator of the universe. When the earth was null and void, when there was darkness upon the deep, let me just share with you right here, make sure you understand the fact that Jesus was there in the creation. When the Bible says, uh, let us make man, Jesus was present. Therefore, he is the creator of the universe. Number four, and we deal with this tonight. Number four, he says, he's the head of the church. Jesus the Christ is the head of the church. He is the one who is the source, the, the head of the church. Number five, he describes Jesus as the firstborn from the dead. And we will unpack that statement tonight also. He is the firstborn from the dead. Jesus Christ is the firstborn, the first man who died and yet lived. So Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Number six, Jesus is the fullness of God. When you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. Jesus Christ is the fullness of God. He has given us God in the capsule of a man. He has given us God in the flesh. Jesus, God himself, left his heavenly throne in glory, robed himself in a body, came down, got off in Bethlehem of Judea, he, Jesus, is the fullness of God. He came down through 42 generations. Jesus is the fullness of God. He gave us who God is. Can't you hear the disciples asking the question, who is God? Matter of fact, he says, one of them says, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Let me just share with you today. Jesus says to him, have you not long been with, so long been with me, yet you don't know me? I and my father are one. Jesus was saying to him, as Paul writes in, in, in Colossians chapter 1, Jesus is the fullness of God. And finally, Paul describes Jesus, the seventh way he described Jesus is the reconciler of all things. Jesus the Christ is the reconciler of all things. He's the one who is the mediator. He is the one who put things together. He's the one who brings bitter disputes to a happy end. Jesus is the reconciler of all things. Let me run through them one more time. Seven things that Paul describes Jesus in, in chapter one of Colossians and throughout the book of Colossians. First of all, this he that you talk about. See, we have to unpack the word he, and we can't take for granted that people know who he is. In verse number 17, it says, and he is before all things. Who is the he? The he is Jesus the Christ. The he is the son of God. He is Jesus Christ. Number one, he's the image of God. Number two, he is the firstborn over creation. Number three, he is the creator of the universe. Number four, he's the head of the church. Number five, he's the firstborn from the dead. Number six, he is the fullness of God. And number seven, he is the reconciler of all things. Jesus is the reconciler 
of all things. So there's seven things that Paul will point out throughout the book of Colossians and describe Jesus. Let's look at the verse. He says, and he, verse 17, Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Jesus is before all things. The word before means he's out front. He's in front. He is prior to. He is above and not beneath. He is before all things. You see, Jesus, we, Jesus wasn't just born in Bethlehem of Judea and he came on the scene. He just came on the scene in Bethlehem of Judea to show himself to us in the flesh. But before there was a when or where, and before there was anything or anybody, Jesus already was. Jesus existed in eternity past. Jesus existed in eternity past, before we got here. Not only that, Jesus exists right now. And also Jesus will and is existing in eternity future. So he was before. He was in front. He was prior to anything else. And not only was he prior to, he was above. He is before. This word before, he's priority. We ought to prioritize Jesus. He was prior to anything else. This word things, this word things mean all things. He, this word things mean that he was before all things. He, he, was, he was before the whole. This word all things, this phrase all things means that, that he was before everything. He was before anybody or anything. Jesus the Christ was before everything, every person, everybody. He was before whatever you can think of. Jesus exists before those things, and he is always. He will be always. So Jesus' existence didn't just start when Mary gave birth to him. His beginning didn't even start when he and John identified each other while they were still in the mother's womb. Jesus existed prior to us getting here. The text says, this is Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things exist. And all things consist. You see, there is nothing that exists without Jesus. There is nothing that consists without Jesus. This word consists means to be set together, to be introduced, to be exhibited, to constitute, to approve, to stand, and to commend. This word exists means to, to, to set together, to put something in order. In other words, nothing exists without Jesus putting it into order. It says, it says and, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Nothing consists, nothing exists, nothing is understood without Jesus. Because Jesus, this word consists says, Consist says he set it together. Jesus introduced it. Jesus is the one who exhibited it. Jesus is the one who constituted that gives us life and gives it meaning. Matter of fact, Jesus is the one who approves it. Nothing exists without Jesus the Christ's approval. It stands and it commends and it commenced because of Jesus. He's God. Nothing exists because of, without him. 
Everything exists because of him. Jesus is the master workman of creation. Jesus, Jesus the Christ himself, he is the master who works through and works with all of creation. There was no creation without Jesus because Jesus is the master creator. He is the master worker. He is the master workman and nothing in creation exists without Jesus and nothing consists, consists without Jesus. So we can make all the discoveries we want. We can make all the, create the, all the inventions we would have to do. But the fact of the matter is, it is just byproducts. Those are just byproducts of what Jesus has already created. Mm -hmm. That's why scientists will even tell you, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It's just changed from one form to the other. Therefore, we understand by Jesus, all things consist. Yes. Without him, nothing consists. Jesus is the master workman of all creation. Thank God for Jesus. Paul does a great job here in these two verses to describe who Jesus is. He goes on in verse number 18. We're at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 18. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. He says that Jesus, he, Jesus, not only is Jesus the son of God, not only is he the son of man, you see this thing, son of God and son of man, it represents Jesus, the same Jesus, but as the son of man, he's human. As the son of God, he's God. See, Jesus, I told you before, this word hyperstatic union, and certainly I misspelled it last time, this word hyperstatic union is H-Y-P-O-S-T-A-T-I-C. Union, the hyperstatic union. H-Y-P-O-S-T-A-T-I-C. P-O-S-T-A-T-I-C, union, the hyperstatic union. So Jesus Christ is the hyperstatic union, meaning that he's just as much God as God. He is God, meaning that he is just as much man as man. He is a man. He came down through 42 generations, got off in a place called Judea, a Bethlehem of Judea, and he became a man. But he never stopped being God. So he's both son of man, human, and he's the son of God, God. Jesus is the master workman. Verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body. This word head means that Jesus is the source. He's not the resource. He is the source. This word head, is, it means that, that one who takes hold of. This word head means that he has, he has responsibility. He has ownership. He is the Lord of the universe. He's the one who senses a sieging of responsibility. This word head means that he, he who is, he who is Jesus Christ, take hold of. This word head means that he has total responsibility. He's not some like some leaders who do not take responsibility for anything. But Jesus take total responsibility for the church. He is the owner. He has ownership of the church. He is the Lord of the universe. This word head, it, it gives us a sense of seizing, seizing the moment. This word is, is a word that, that gives us the idea that Jesus has sealed and Jesus has seized the moment as the head of the body. He is the head. He is the source. 
Jesus is never a resource. He is the source. You see, your job is a resource. <laughs> your, your, your car is a resource. Your house is a resource. Meaning that it is a byproduct of what the source has given to you. Therefore, we understand Jesus and Jesus alone is our source. There's no one like him. He's our source. That's why when you get your pink slip, you need to understand you may have a pink slip, but the job that you had was never your source. It was just a means. It was just a resource. Jesus is the source. So he says, Paul says that he's the head. He's the source. He has ownership. Jesus has total responsibility. And he has so much responsibility for the church until he gave his very life for the church. He is the source, the Lord of the universe. Yes. He says that not only that, he says, and he is the head of the body. This word body is talking about a particular type of body. It is the living family. The body is a spiritual body. Paul oftentimes compares the physical body that we live in to the body of Christ. But Jesus is the head of the living family, the head of this spiritual body. He is the head of the sound whole. He is even the head of the slave ship. In other words, we are to be slaves to Christ, and Jesus is the head of us. No assembly, no denomination, no particular group can claim themselves to only be the body. I hear denominations all the time saying that we are the body of Christ. We are the body of the church. Let me tell you, no particular denomination, no particular group, no particular assembly can claim to be the body. Jesus Christ is the head of the body, and because he's the head of the body, he is the head of the living family, the spiritual body, the whole, the whole assembly. What I've just said to you is just because you go to a church at a certain location, you can't claim that that location is the only body that Jesus has. Not only that, just because you are a member of a particular denomination, you cannot claim that you are the only right denomination when it comes to Jesus. Yes. Jesus is the head of the living family, the body. When he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, and he is the head of the body, then he identifies what body he's talking about. He says, the church. He is the head of the body, the church. The church comes from the Greek word ekasia. This word means a calling out, a calling from among. The church body itself, it is a popular meeting. The church is a religious uh, congregation. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the assembly, the assembly of a Christian community. It is believers and Jesus Christ. I know we, we, we leave home to go to church. And that's good because there is a brick, mortar, wood place that we call church. It is where we get together. It is where we fellowship. It is called the church. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you ought to go to church. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25 says, you ought to attend church. Yes. You ought to be at the assembly of God. You ought to be at the location that's made of brick and mortar, that's made of wood and stubble. You ought to show up on Sunday, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever your church day is, you ought to show up at the church. 
You ought to be there. You ought to be there. When you look at Acts chapter 2, the church knew how to worship and the church knew how to get together. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, the Bible declares that the first century saints went to church on a regular basis. They went to the house called church. They went to the temple called church. What that says is they had a small group and they went to church in that small group. And then when they got together in the temple, they had a large group. And when they went, got together in that large group, people from the small groups came together. Yes, sir. And they went from house to house, breaking bread and fellowshipping with the Lord. The church itself are the believers. So there, there's a place called church. And there's a body, the Christian body. It's what Paul talking about in Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 through 18. There's a body of believers, believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those who have confessed Christ as their personal Savior, those who have trusted Jesus in the death, burial, his resurrection, those who stand and, and proclaim that I'm on my way to heaven and the only way I'm getting there is that I trust what Jesus has done on the cross. Amen. You see, it's not about what we do. It's not about the faith we have. It's not about the mercy we have on others. It's not about good deeds. We only get to heaven based on what Christ has already done on the cross. He died, he buried, he was buried, he rose, and he was seen. The Bible says those believers who believe that story, they make up the church. So there's a place called church. There's an organism. There are people, the organism called church. And then there's an atmosphere that is called church. It, it is what we do after Sunday service or after Wednesday night Bible study or Tuesday night Bible study or Saturday evening, whatever your worship time would be, is when we leave the church and say, we certainly had some church today. It is an atmosphere. It is an atmosphere uh, that God is in the, in the presence of the place. God is in this place. Yeah. It's an atmosphere. It is an atmosphere where God shows himself and reveals himself because God is everywhere at the same time. Yes, whether we feel him, whether he, we see him, whether we follow his acts or not, God is present and the atmosphere is one that we realize that God is present. Yes. When he shows up, miracles happen. When he shows up, we get happy about it. When he shows up, when the atmosphere is right, church takes place. You don't see people playing, playing with the baby when church is going on. You don't, people, you don't see people laughing and talking when church is going on. When you have the atmosphere called church, you understand really, really well that this is a time to get with the Lord. And you don't have to go to the church to be in the atmosphere. You don't have to be among other believers for the atmosphere of church to get right. When the atmosphere is right, you can only have that atmosphere in the spirit and in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. When we're having some church, we, we, we know how messed up we are because God is so perfect. When we're having church, when we have the atmosphere of church, when the atmosphere is right to have church, and when we are rejoicing in the Lord, we understand stand that it's only because of God's presence that we are rejoicing. Yes. You see, it doesn't matter if you got a lot of money or not. That's the good thing about God. You don't have to have a lot of money to get in the atmosphere. This atmosphere called church, this, this, this kind of kneel with God, this, this fellowshipping with God. We go to the building to fellowship with others, but we also go to the building to fellowship with God. We don't have to be at the building to fellowship with him. We can be in our car. We can be in our living room. We can be in our dining room. We can be in our bedroom because everywhere we go, God is there. We have to make sure that we get in tune with God. The, the, the name and the claim of church call it a shifting in the atmosphere. 
And when there's a shift, what they, they saying is, when there's a shift in the atmosphere, you can tell that God is making his presence known. Yes. Let me tell you, don't look for the shift. Don't look for the speaking in tongues. Sometimes God shows up in a small, still voice. You need to make sure that you're on the right path to hear from the Lord. Amen. When church is going on, when the atmosphere is right, you can hear from the Lord and you don't need a whole lot of people there. Church. So he says, Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 through 18. He says in verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. So there we have it. We have a place called church. We have an atmosphere called church. And we have a people called church. He's talking about the people called church. He, he's talking about those who believe the story that Jesus died and rose again. Those who trust this story to get to heaven. Those who trust this story to live for now on. It is called church. It is the body of Christ. It is the body, and Jesus is the head of the body, the church. It says Jesus is also the beginning. Jesus is the beginning. He, when we use the word beginning in this sense, we mean the commencement. Too often when children graduate from high school, graduate from preschool, graduate from, from uh, junior high school, they think their graduation is the end. This word commencement, this word beginning means that you, you have a commencement exercise. This word commencement means it is a point where you begin. So when you graduate from high school, that ought not be your last time. <clears throat> it is the beginning of life. Amen. It is the beginning of a new page. It is the beginning. It is a new beginning. It is the beginning of a new atmosphere. It is the beginning of a new kind of lifestyle. It's, this word beginning means commencement. It means the chief. And because it's describing Jesus, it means that he is the chief, the first, the very first in power. Mm -hmm. The very first in rule. The very first in principle. And the very first in principality. He is the mag magistrate. Because he's the very first in principalities, we understand that we walk not in, in, in a spirit of the flesh. We walk not in sight. We walk by faith. And Paul says that there's a war going on in Ephesians chapter 6. And he says this war is in heavenly places, in high places, in principalities. I want to tell you today that Jesus is first. He is the highest in principalities. Amen. He is the power. He is the rule himself. He is the chief of all principalities. He is the beginning. This word beginning means commencement. It, it means that the, the power, it means the rule, the principle, and the principality. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, he says that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn means God first begotten. The firstborn from the dead. We talked, to, we talked about the fact that he is the first, he is the firstborn of all creation. But I want to tell you, not only is he the firstborn of all creation, he's the firstborn from the dead. Mm -hmm. yes. He is the first begotten. He is the first one to rise from the dead. He is the first one to rise from the dead in an immortal body. Jesus is the only one. He's the first one. He's the only one who died, got up, and still living. Jesus the Christ. He's the, he's the only one who died. He, he's the only one who laid down. He, he's the only one who rose again and never died again. I know what you're saying. Well, well, Lazarus was raised from the dead. You're right, but Lazarus laid down and died again. Yes. But our Lord, Jesus the Christ, 
He rose to never, ever die again. He's the first born from the dead. He continues to live in a powerful, indestructive life. Because he's the first born from the dead, he continues to live. Christ's resurrection marks Jesus' triumph over death, hell, and the grave. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, because he's the firstborn from the dead, he is the one who stopped death, and death never caught him again. He's the one that caused the shaking, and the grave had to give him up. He's the one, Jesus is the one who rose from the dead, and when he rose from the dead, he never laid down again. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn. And the good thing about it is, because he's the firstborn from the dead, one of these days we're going to get up again. That's why Paul says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, he says, Brethren, I have you not to be uninformed. I have you not to be ignorant concerning those who are asleep. Because those who died in Christ Jesus with this lively hope of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, don't worry about them because they're going to meet us in the air one day and they will get up first. Yes. King James says that we will not prevent those who are asleep. This word prevent in the original Greek text means that we will, we will not perceive those who are asleep. In other words, those who are asleep in Christ, those who died with this lively hope, those who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they going to rise first. Mm -hmm. Amen. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, he says, and those of us who remain will be caught up together with Christ in midair. Mm -hmm. So Jesus being the first one to rise from the dead who never died again, Guess what's going to happen? We're going to get up to never die again. Yes. Those who love him, those who have, have trusted him, those who believe the story, we will rise again. He says he's the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he have preeminence. This word dead, it doesn't mean that Jesus was asleep. <laughs> And it doesn't mean that we're going to be asleep because when you sleep, you look like you're getting up again. <laughs> yeah, we're going to sleep in the grave, but at the trump of God, at the voice of the archangel, we're going to get up again. Mm -hmm. we, we're going to be dead. We're going to be a corpse. We're going to be destitute of life. We are destitute of life. We have no life when we're dead, but one of these days, Jesus is going to get us up again. Yes. You just have to believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus raised himself from the dead. And one of these days, at the voice of the archangel, at the trump of God, he's going to raise us up again also Amen. to forever be with the Lord. He is the firstborn from the dead. He was raised to immortality. We're going to be raised. This mortal will put on immortality. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, this corruption will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality, and we will forever be with the Lord. Amen. He is the firstborn from the dead, and we're going to rise. We're going to rise from the dead also. He's the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, how many things? All things. This word all means whole. This word all means every. This word all means any. This word all means whosoever. This word all means whoever. We will all. <laughs> he is above all. Mm -hmm. says, he, says, he says that in all things, he have preeminence. This word preeminence means first in rank. And first in influence. This word preeminence means that God 
has given Jesus a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Yes. At the name of Jesus, every tongue must confess Amen. that Jesus is Lord. He has preeminence. The fact is he's the first in rank and he's the first in influence. He is holding first place down. He is the highest in first place. He is in the highest place. And the good news is he is eternal. Yes, sir. Not only is he eternal, eternal, he's everlasting. Not only is he eternal and everlasting, he's from, for, from now on forever and ever. This Jesus that we're talking about, he has preeminence. The question tonight is, does he have preeminence in your life? Is Jesus holding first place down in your life? Is Jesus not only your Savior, but he's your Lord? For when he has preeminence in your life, he's the first in rank. He's the first in influence. He is the eternal one. He's holding first place in your life. He is the highest place that you will ever find any general holding down. Jesus Christ, our great general. We're used to four-star generals, five-star generals. Jesus Christ outranked them. Yes. He outranked them in influence. He outranked them in, in status. He is the preeminent one. If he's not preeminent in your life today, you ought to try Jesus. Amen. I recommend Jesus to you today because he has preeminence in my life. He has first place in my life. If you're here today and you've never re received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is your moment. Mm -hmm. This is your opportunity. This is your chance to get to know him. Jesus Christ, verse, verse 17 says that Jesus the Christ is before all things, and in him all things consist. In Jesus Christ, salvation is made available. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. You ought to try him for he's waiting for you. You ought to try him for the spirit of God is saying you ought to give him first place in your life. Jesus want to be first place. He can't be first place unless you trust him. Unless you believe in him. Unless you give him an opportunity to come into your life. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to get to know Jesus. Trust him to be your savior. Trust him to be your Lord. That too many of us know we're going to heaven anyway and we're not allowing him to be our Lord, to be our God, to be our source. To be the, the image of God in our lives. You see, we can't do it by ourselves. We've tried him. we tried her. we tried them and we tried it. I recommend that you try Jesus. Trust him. Believe in him. And allow him into your life. You can do that today by joining me in this simple prayer. Believing that Jesus died for your sins. And out of obedience unto God, he died and rose again. The Bible teaches in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you can just believe that he died and rose, you can be saved today. Will you trust him? Will you trust him to get you from earth to glory? The door of the church is open. You ought to trust Jesus. Yes. And if that is you, if that is you and you're the one, who trust Jesus today and you believe the story, just bow your head and repeat after me and invite him into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. 
I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new creature. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. We believe if you prayed this prayer and honestly believe the story that Jesus died and rose again and you're trusting that story to get you to heaven, we believe that you're born again. And in that new birth experience, you're on your way to heaven. We all got to leave here. You want to go to heaven when you die. If you prayed this simple prayer and received Jesus Christ today, inbox me and let me know that you're now part of the fellowship of Christ. You're now part of the body of Christ. You're now part of the church of Christ. Inbox me and let me know if you received him today. And for those of you who don't have a church home or you in between church homes, I, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Where Jesus is the captain of the ship where we walk with Jesus and he gives us direction. If you want to join or be a part of the New Beginning Church, inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. And we'll be glad to welcome you to the family of faith. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part. And it also, if you need prayer, inbox me so we can pray with you and pray for you. I've been getting emails and inboxes for people praying. We've been lifting those people in prayer. And we want to continue to lift them and we want to lift you in prayer. Now it is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. We thank God for this privilege this time of giving, it's time to give, give to the Lord. You can give to the New Beginning Church. You can give by Cash App. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Dollar sign NBC Souls. You can give to the New Beginning Church by Cash App. Dollar sign NBC Souls. Cash App NBC Souls. Or you can give by Zelle. Our Zelle email is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea here is from Romans 12, 32. If we lift up Jesus, he will draw all men unto us, unto himself. Now you can mail your offering in at P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 That's P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Let me just thank you for joining us again here tonight for our Bible study You can continue to join us every Wednesday night at 7.20 p.m. For our Bible study, you can join us at 7.20 p.m. for our Bible study every Wednesday night. You can also join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. 9 a.m. every Sunday for Sunday school. You can join us on these same stations on, on, uh, on Zoom as well as Facebook Live. You can join us. And also for our worship service on Sunday morning, you can join us right here at the same station on Zoom and Facebook Live at 1045 every Sunday for our worship service. We'll be glad to have you as a part of our, our services as well as a part of our church. We really thank you. We really appreciate your joining us on tonight. We thank you for being a part of our service. Please, ma'am, please, sir, after we have gone off the air, and we finished this broadcast. Share it with somebody. Share it with a friend. This is our way of reaching souls for Christ during this season. We don't gather anymore into the church building, but the church must continue to be the church. The world is looking for the church to be the church. 
And this is the way we share Christ uh, with other people. So hit the share button and share with everybody on your page and everybody that you're connected with. Uh, share this broadcast with them so souls can come to Jesus Christ. And men, women, boys, and girls can fall out with their evil ways and trust Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. We want to give Jesus preeminence, first place in our lives. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another chance, Father God, to dive into your word, to hear your word, to be blessed by your word. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus Christ, the image of God, is the head of the body, the head of the church, the beginning, and he is the end. Thank you, Lord, that he is preeminent in our lives, and Jesus Christ is able to make life the better for each of us. Lord, we thank you for every listener. We ask you to bless them in the midst of all their concerns. Heal and touch as only you can. Bless, Lord, as only you can. Lord, we pray for the eradication of this virus, that men will go back to do things that are pleasing in your sight once again. And Lord, until we can gather again in fellowship at the location called church, we pray that you, we, we, the church, be about your business. The believers of God will call men to Christ, and disciple men to follow Jesus. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling, the only great God, the preeminent one, Jesus the Christ, to him be power, glory, and dominion. And the church said, amen. Again, thank you so much. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we're reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Again, God bless you. God keep you is our prayer. Thank you again for being a part of our service. <laughs>